Welcome to Indoctrination, a weekly conversation series about protecting yourself from systems of control. I'm your host, Rachel Bernstein. Hi, everybody. I just want to reiterate before talking about Anna that if you're interested in the support group that I run every other week, please contact me at BernsteinLMFT at gmail.com. And also, please go to patreon.com slash indoctrination to become a supporter of the show and get some merchandise and also get my weekly check-ins. Thank you. Here is part two of my two-part conversation with Anna. I bet that when we finish this part two, that you're going to want to hear more from her. If so, please let me know. I'll contact her again. It's always really nice to speak with her. Here's a little bit about Anna for people who were not introduced to her during the first show last week. But if you haven't heard part one, please do so after checking this out. Anna grew up in a fundamentalist Christian family as part of the Quiverful movement. She and her six siblings were not allowed to attend school and were very isolated from the outside world. Everything about her childhood was also strictly controlled from the clothes she wore to the media she had access to. She was expected to teach herself from primarily religious texts, as well as teaching and caring for the younger children. Her future was laid out for her as a submissive wife and mother to many children. She left at the age of 19 with the help of some family members, starting life in a very unfamiliar world with little education. She talks about how daunting that was, but also how thrilling. Seven years later, she's still sifting through memories. She makes videos on TikTok. Definitely check them out. That's how I found out about her. Recounting her experiences and has found that many other folks grew up in similar circumstances. Many kids are undoubtedly still in that situation, and Anna hopes she can raise awareness and play a part in helping others. In fact, I have heard from people who listen to the show who are still in situations like these and use this show and maybe others to get a sense about why it is that they're having feelings that something isn't okay about their life and how to define that, and also how to gain some strength and perspective to potentially branching out and leaving that situation and starting their life anew or just starting their life in general. Here is part two of my conversation with Anna. People will contact me and they'll say, you know, I really do think I need to heal from what I've been through, but I know nothing about money and I know nothing about how to handle a job and deal with someone telling me what to do and asking questions and just sort of the basics of how to be in the world and the social norms. So can we start with that? And there's so much practical information that you do need to get along with healing from what you've been through. It takes an enormous, I just want people to have a sense of the inordinate amount of bravery it takes and energy and how exhausting it is. And also how nice it is along the way when you find the people who will say, oh, I'll show you or, oh, I'll help you. (laughs) Because there are those people Sometimes they're too few and far between, but they are there that help you go from one step to the next, where you can also ask a question that you think by your age, you're supposed to know the answer to, but you have no way of having that answer yet. So I think from that point, I mean, leaving, what did you do? How did you find a place to live? I mean, what steps did you take? The first thing that kind of happened as I was in my like, 18 year old depression of like, I don't know how to leave, but I want to. It was a family from church who kind of, I think, could tell that I was not doing great. They were on good terms with my mom. And so they were like, hey, Anna could come do some work for us at our house and maybe 
spend the night, maybe spend a couple days here every week. We could really use her help. And that was acceptable. And so I started doing that. And a couple days grew to like more days per week that I would, and I, until I was basically living with these people. And it was quite a revelation because by that point, I knew that like, oh, my mom is, I always knew she was strict and that like our family was more strict than other families. But I didn't think more than that. By that point, I was like, oh, I think my mom is abusive. I thought her beliefs and everything we were taught, that's just Christianity. So I didn't know that there were Christians who weren't fundamentalist and culty, but these people were. So I was so shocked when they would like pour themselves a glass of wine for, for dinner or say shit or like all these, all these kind of like normal things. But I was just shocked because I was like, how can, how can you, you, you're a Christian, but you do, you do this. Like they were, they seemed so normal to me but like I didn't know what normal was uh but I knew whatever whatever they had I wanted to be more like that the mom of the family gave me some of her old clothes so I jeans that fit me and like I thought I looked like oh I look like everyone else now and that was kind of I guess the stepping stone was family there and then I was technically still living with my mom she actually (laughs) this I wish I could say that oh I just I lived with these other people and I learned it was better and then I left but actually I moved back in with my mom because she bribed me with college she did not want me to get my GED which I got against her wishes but once I got it she was like well you can go to community college and I will pay for it but you have to live at home I knew that if I wanted to go to college and set it up and everything on my own, I wouldn't be able to, I didn't know anything about applying or getting any sort of scholarship or anything because I couldn't pay for it. So I just took her, I took her up on that and I moved back in for a semester and then going to community college, it was even more of the real world and meeting real normal people. And it was during that semester that I was like, oh, absolutely gotta live in this real world, can't ever go back. And so at the end of that semester, my sister bought me a plane ticket and I packed two suitcases and I left and I never went back. Wow. Your sister who had been kicked out. Yes. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. Thank goodness for her. I know. Going back to this family also, there are these things and people who are what we call transitional objects. They're in this in-between place between worlds at times. And they help you get to have a different perspective and see also like you were able to see that you can be a good person and a good Christian, whatever, however you define that, if that was important to you and still dot, 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 drink wine, wear jeans, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I'm sure then that made a lot of other things start to unravel in your mind. Like, wow, maybe it wasn't necessary for me to not do this. And maybe it wasn't necessary for me to have to do this. And so sometimes there's this domino effect. And so I think after that, going back to living at home, how did you see your mom in a different way when you moved back home? Ooh, this part of my memory is honestly a little fuzzy. I I think she was trying to connect with me more as an adult. And I think she was also afraid of me leaving forever. Um, And so she honestly was less controlling, but I could still see all the, the toxic attitudes and, and beliefs. And I also was realizing around that time that I was queer and heard her mention some homophobic things and I was like I will never I will never be accepted or have a good relationship with this person because we're at this point we're already too different and I barely have been out of her home for like a few months and I already know that we can't connect and even I was like for a a time trying to be like, oh, maybe this can be something. Maybe we can kind of rebuild on something that isn't just based in like what happened during childhood or whatever. Because people do that kind of rebuild relationships with parents, like as adults and peers. But uh, it became clear that that was not going to happen, at least in a healthy way. 
I would have had to submit to her rules and her beliefs about how I should live. And in fact, I did tell her right before I left that, you know, you say these things about people who like the same gender. Well, I do. And then that was kind of a like throw in her face kind of thing. And then when I left, I don't remember exactly what she said as I was like walking out with my two suitcases that something about like, she said something about like me not being welcomed back. <laughs> It was like uh, she disowned me, but I also disowned her. It was it was mutual. Right. <laughs> it was mutual <laughs> disowning. Okay. And have you talked to her since? Or? No. Oh. It has been seven years. Wow. Wow. Okay. So I want to come back to that. There's something that you mentioned before that I want to come back to before we get into more modern day. Going from homeschooling, when you were talking about the lack of laws around homeschooling, I want to make sure to talk about that because I think people don't really know a a lot about that. And that, yes, there are some people, I do want to say, who homeschool their kids, who follow certain curricula, and they, they do it for a lot of different reasons that aren't necessarily religious because their kids have different issues or there isn't a school nearby, whatever the situation is. This isn't to say it's all bad. But because there isn't oversight in the way that there should be, especially with religious education, it leaves a lot of gaps. And here you were getting your GED and then going on to college. So let's talk a little bit about the educational piece, if you can, just about what you want people to know about homeschooling and also what it was like for you to just be in a regular school after that. Yeah, for sure. Most people don't know in in the state I grew up in, in Utah, all you have to do to homeschool your kid is to notify your local school district that your kids are being homeschooled, and then that's it. You don't have to do anything else. There's no requirements for what you have to teach. There's no tests. There's no follow-up. No one will ever come to your house and be like, oh, hey, how are your kids doing? There, There is nothing. And about half of the country has rules like that. Some states, you don't even have to send notice. You just don't have to send your kid to school at all. You just don't have to. Even in states with what I would consider like reasonable regulations, New York and Pennsylvania have the most strict rules. When I talk about it on TikTok, I get replies from people that are like, oh, well, I was there and there are religious exemptions. I didn't have to take any of the tests or follow the rules or whatever. So it seems even the laws that are in place don't necessarily have to be followed. If there are ways to skirt them, there are loopholes. And so I I do want to emphasize that I don't think homeschooling is inherently bad, but I think uh, my spouse was homeschooled for four years by his mom, who is a teacher. So, and he got a very good education. Uh, But uh, homeschooling attracts abusive people because it is so unregulated. So abusive people know that no one need ever see their child. No one will ever spot any abuse because their kid will never leave home. No one will ever see. I saw a statistic that made me very sad in cases of child abuse that was so severe could be considered torture. In a recent study, only 12% of those kids were in school and the rest were homeschooled. Of course, no schooling was likely taking place. Those kids were just at home to be punching bags, but that's legal. Not the punching bag part, but the the unregulated, just keep your kids at home and teach them nothing. That's legal in many states. When you have something that can become a bastion for abusers, then you know something's quite wrong and needs to be certainly regulated and there needs to be oversight. You're right. And so going back to then being in school, One of the things that I talk to a lot of people about is critical thinking and questioning and disagreeing and exploring subjects that they weren't supposed to explore and the anxiety they have around that. And I remember there was a boy who was 
14, I don't know how old he is now, this is many years ago, who had been raised on a compound. And I went with him for his first day in a regular school at age 14. And he was really afraid. He didn't know about the sights and the sounds and the bells. And he felt really self-conscious that he needed to pray before he ate and no one else was praying before they ate. And he was afraid of disagreeing with anyone. And he was afraid of raising his hand and questioning because that was punishable in his group. And also he was afraid afraid that if he talked to a girl in the school, he would need to marry her. So I'm curious about your experience. I think a lot of, because I was always a very like obedient, uh, followed authority kind of child. I I think some of the, I hate to say this, but I, I think some of the like authoritarian nature of how I grew up made me a good student or at least it made teachers like me because I was obsessive like gotta do all my homework gotta gotta please the teachers it also made me a good employee do everything the boss says gotta go above and beyond Um, and that's something I'm trying to curb now because you can't always go above and beyond Uh, you gotta take care of yourself but my first day going to college, I actually just went to straight up the wrong building, like the next door building that wasn't even the college. And so I'm wandering around this like random government building being like, I'm supposed to be in an art class. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know how to find like the room. I, I finally did, but I felt so lost but I knew like you sit there and you listen to the instructor and you just do what they say. (laughs) But buying supplies and books, because I went back to college after that first semester, but then I had to do it completely on my own. So getting financial aid, all of that was new to me, but I had Google, (laughs) which was great. So I could just Google whatever info, then just life advice also in general, you just Google whatever because Google won't shame you for not knowing something. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> you can ask all sorts of dumb questions and uh, and Google will give you the answers. Uh, so when I was first in college, I, I was just, I was mainly just obsessed with looking normal and fitting in, which I'm sure I still didn't. But I was like, gotta, how are other people doing their hair? Gotta do, gotta do my hair that way. How, what are people wearing? Got it. Can I get some of those? clothes I didn't want to stand out or be the weird one or it to be obvious where I came from I also had a hard time talking with people and some of the first buddies I made were just older guys who probably saw that I was young and naive and in hindsight that was probably uh, less than great <laughs> <laughs> right right uh, a little potentially dangerous but I just wonder about having conversations in general. I mean, how did you do that? Did you wait for someone to approach you? Did, could you go up to someone and start talking? I mean, all of this is new territory. Oh, I would never approach like someone I didn't know. I mean, to this day, I don't do that. I do have social anxiety. It's hard to know where it all comes from. But if like someone says something to me, then I can keep up a conversation decently well. It's it's hard for me to know now how awkward or out of touch I appeared um, because I was trying so hard I was like oh I I sound I sound normal I no one no one suspects a thing but probably in hindsight it was it's very obvious that I was was somehow different yeah (laughs) maybe maybe I mean but also you were you were studying right you were observing And you may have also then connected with other people who might consider themselves sort of quirky or different in some way. You know, those will often be, you know, people leaving situations that they were raised in that were different. Those become their people. Yes. And I did. I found my people relatively quickly when I was looking for my first place to live, I knew Craigslist existed. And so I was like, okay, because my parents had sold an old RV on Craigslist. And I remembered, I was like, ooh, Craigslist is where you got to go. <laughs> and so I was looking for, for places to live because I didn't want to just live with my sister. I felt that I had to like be on my own and, and actually start being a grown adult. And so I found at that point, I was like looking for my local queer community because I was like this is where I gotta be I gotta meet people maybe I'll meet someone I like and I found a listing for 
a house that was specifically like everyone who lives here is queer and I was like oh, that's the place I gotta I gotta live there and it was also like way cheaper for rent than anywhere else well because it was like a falling down house with like and my bedroom was just like a little shoebox of a room but it was a space that was mine like I didn't care how crappy the living situation it was it felt amazing um, and I I lied and told them I had a job because <laughs> I didn't <laughs> and and I met them and it went well and they said I could move in and then then once I was moved in I was like of course I hardly had anything to move in I had like a twin mattress on the floor and two suitcases <laughs> but I was like now okay now I have to have a find a job but I was like I have no resume I have I have a GED now but that doesn't count for too much so I kind of took stock of my skills and like what can I do I can sew and I can cook the those are skills yep. yes they are <laughs> so uh I found again on Craigslist I found a prep cook position and it said come to a group interview and so I was like "Ooh, this is the one because I can't send out a resume to people because I don't have a resume but I can go to a group interview because I know I can like I can smile and I can like shake a hand uh, <laughs> uh, yes. and it's so funny because this uh this interview where I ended up getting my first job was uh working for the Mormon church <laughs> That's funny. Oh, okay so I found the queer community found a place to live found my first job and through that job actually I found someone who introduced me to the kink community which was for, I really found my people. And that was a whole, talk about going from one extreme to the next. Uh, <laughs> so th there was these people who were a lot of recovering from some kind of trauma or real ground, but just expressing themselves like literally however they wanted and just eager to get to know people, welcome people, like I didn't, I didn't feel weird and out of place there because I, like you said, you find your own group of quirky people and those were the weird quirky people. That's where I grew to feel really accepted and to really make friends was in the BDSM community. And that really helped also recover from a lot of like, it's hard to say, I almost want to say sexual trauma, but it was all kind of mental what I would believe and fantasize as a teenager. It, it, I mean, it's still trauma, even if, if no one's actively doing anything to you, but it helped me a lot with that too, to just kind of look at everything in a, in a new mindset and to have everything heavily revolve around consent. I was just going to say that. I think that makes all the difference. At least the local community, people ask if they can hug you. Like that's how, that's how seriously they take it, which is lovely. Right. I think, you know, sometimes as with any community, sometimes it can attract people who are not necessarily so healthy. So that's always something to watch out for because it's so counterproductive for a lot of reasons why people get involved in this, that they're trying to heal something or trying to reframe just their rights and having a voice. And like you're saying, consent, getting to know your body, learning whom to trust and behaving in a way where another person can trust you. And so I think, yeah, I'm sure that it was very healing and educational also about just a lot of, and also getting comfort with just using certain language and talking about certain things that were never able to be talked about. Well, I'm saying that like, oh, the King community was wonderful for me. There are weird and unhealthy people also. <laughs> I'm happy to hear, though, that you've been able to explore being in different communities and meeting people and finding communities that are also healthy, that where I think there's sort of full disclosure, where you feel respected, where you get to have your voice matter, that you can say yes, you can say no, and someone's going to follow suit based on what you say, which is a really wonderful thing. What's also true about some of the work that I've done and some of the people who have been on the show is that they've talked about having been raised in communities that were very strict in terms of their belief and, and their dress code and the behaviors and everyone kind of needing to be the same and that conformity was paramount and you needed to not stand out or do things your own way in individualized ways. 
And for some people that makes them very anxious about seeing anything that looks anything like that. And for other people, a large number of people, they find that without even realizing it, they kind of gravitated towards something that was all too familiar because they kind of knew how to be in that environment and it didn't trigger the same kinds of questions or um, wonderings as it might to someone else because of its familiarity. So I'm just wondering about that for you, if that's something that took place in your adult life, as wonderful as your adult life is now, were there some bumps in the road? Three years ago now at this point, I did get recruited, I guess, for like a straight up cult. <laughs> straight up cult. I love that. Like it's, I mean, everyone defines cult slightly differently, but uh, this definitely, I feel like anyone looking from the outside would be like, whoa, that's a cult. <laughs> uh, it's not just like, oh, oh, is that family conservative, weird, blah. like me growing up, someone might not have automatically thought cult, but this was, whew. um I had met the person I'm now married to and he had some friends who were all part of this group and it was supposed to be this like self-help, educational, like find yourself, find your authentic self. Uh, And, and they were all encouraging him to, to do this program. And we had just started dating and I, I knew I had been around these people and so I I didn't know a lot but I knew a little bit and I was like I think this takes up a lot of your time and I don't want you to spend all your time with these people and not with me so because I was very interested in in this new partner and so I was like I will do it with you and then this is the thing we can do together and then we can like bond that was kind of how I got into it was secondhand and it got weird real fast. It's hard to describe without, I tried to keep things vague, especially on TikTok, but um, it was these meetings that we had to go to for, it was one weekend every month and there was like homework and, and stuff we had to do between meetings also, but we would have instructors, but everything was kind of about like emotionally breaking you down and making you feel vulnerable and like sharing feel like you were really connected and had to share with these people around you and then you would you would trauma bond with the other people in your in your class um and then there were also requirements like there were literal uniforms and that should have been just like the biggest red flag but (laughs) uh there were uniforms and we did like military drills it got it got weird real fast, uh, but it was all under like, oh, but the, like this is tradition. Like our our founder liked these specific like pants, so that's why we all wear these pants. Like it it, uh-huh. <laughs> it was under it was under the guise of like we're follow we're just following in the in this in this tradition, but it wasn't optional to follow in the tradition. It was mandatory. <laughs> uh huh. Okay. And it got to a point where it was just taking up all of our time and energy. Like it was so emotionally draining. So time consuming, we had to pay for these classes. And then we also had to put on fundraisers and raise money for the group. And there was no accountability about where the money went. And, and it was funny because we felt like we had been through this whole ordeal. The classes lasted nine months the better part of a year and that was just the level two basically there was a a higher level that you could go to for a year and a half and you would be invited into a family all this like higher higher level stuff that we didn't even participate in because we got out (laughs) and that's when I actually remember I thought that the like the leadership and stuff really cared about me because I would, of course, fall apart and then have these long conversations. They would like put me back together. And I I remember being like, oh, they're they're my friends. They really care about me. And then when I like graduated this program and I got handed a an invitation, a fancy invitation to join the next level of the program, I was like, oh, these people don't care about me because if they know everything I went through. I actually, I was so anxious for, this is getting serious. I was so anxious during a part of this program that I like fully overdosed and woke up in, in ICU 
And I kept going even after that because I was so determined to finish it so that I could have a leg to stand on when I told other people that it was bad. <laughs> I was like, if, people, if I don't finish, people are just going to say I'm a quitter or that I don't know everything because I didn't finish. And I'm like, I'm going to finish and then I'm going to tell people it's bad. Uh, that's where I was at that point. Woof. But uh Wow. How interesting. So your disgust had to be fully informed and authentic. But when I was handed that invitation, I was like, if you wanted what's best for me, you would not want me to do more because you know what it did to me. You just want bodies in your program and you want people who will work for you for free and give you money. That's what you want. (laughs) And that's what that I should have had that light bulb moment earlier but because I was planning I was like oh I'm not gonna stay in this program but maybe I'll stay friends with these people and then that was when I was like oh no these people don't care about me at all and it's so hard when you find that out and when you realize it because the whole point of it it seemed to be I don't know what this group is and that's okay but that that here you're getting into like your darkest and your deepest fill in the blank everything And, you know, so many of these groups, uh, smaller and larger, sort of large group awareness training groups are about this, about, you know, asking people to share their secrets or the biggest traumas they've ever had or their worst fears or all of it. And then you do have this sense that you're very close to the people there and they're really helping you through this moment that you don't realize they manufactured. And then they will, I sort of, I give this visual, I've given this visual before on this show that they knock you down. They don't want you to realize that they're the ones who kind of knocked you down into this puddle of tears on the ground, but you just see their hand reaching down and helping you back up. And then you feel so indebted and appreciative and dependent on them as well. That's absolutely what it was like, even though it cost a lot for that like year of my life. But in the long run, I felt like I got out before anything really bad happened. <laughs> like, Yeah. And also there was a third level. And with most of these groups, there's a fourth and a fifth, and then you become staff. And then, you you know, you're, they're never done. They're never, because it's a business usually. So they're never done. But it, even if the thing that they're pushing is quote unquote self-help. And so I'm so glad you're free from that. And so as we finish up now with your joyously cult-free life, I'm curious for you just to share anything that you'd wanted to share you didn't have a chance to, or in part, whatever wisdom you would like, and anyone who, who is listening. And also, I want to let you know that there are many people listening who are going to be relating to your story. And as I hear from a lot of people that even though we can't see them listening to this, they're nodding their heads and smiling and going, "Uh uh-huh, and then calling their friend, oh, this person just talked about exactly our life. So this will be heard and felt by a lot of people. So what else would you just like people to hear or know as we're finishing up? For the people who relate, you're not alone. And I think that's a big deal and I've experienced that with putting my story out there and seeing so many people relate is that I feel like I have a sense of community of people who experience the same things and I'm not alone I'm not isolated and that's a wonderful wonderful feeling and there are online communities for everything it seems like you can find your ex-Jehovah's Witnesses or your your ex-Mormons or whatever you want to find to feel like you're in community with people who went through the same things you did and have now come out and are kind of like looking back at their past. And I found that on TikTok and I'm sure it exists on other places on the internet. And I think that's a, a wonderful thing. And People ask me sometimes like how to help kids who they know who are stuck in fundamentalism. And I just, I actually give the same advice that I think I heard you give similar advice when I listened back to this podcast of just like, if you know a kid who is in that situation, just stay in their life, even if it means making nice with their parents, even though you don't agree with what the parents are doing. Anyone who ever confronted my parents, I never saw again. They were just cut out of our lives. And so sometimes, sometimes I feel bitter at people for like, oh, why didn't you do anything? Why didn't you help us? But then I remember the people who tried to help us, who got just kicked to the curb. So they never had the chance. Our own like grandparents had to kind of 
play nice and smile and not say anything against my parents so that they would be able to see us. And that's a big deal to just have someone who's isolated like that just see that the outside world isn't bad or scary for a kid to kind of chip away at that programming all they have to if if they think everyone outside of their group is bad or evil and and they know you and you are excessively nice they will see that you're not bad you're not evil and so that's kind of the advice I try to impart is like be the outside person who is good so they can see that little by little they can see that what they're being taught isn't true. Of course, my experience comes from being a child in this. I know not everyone who has experienced things like this grows up in it. Right. But I think you're right. And it's reminding me of the family that needed your help, right, at their house. (laughs) And uh, we're, I think, really stepping in in that way and found a way to not be at odds with your mom so that it could be successful. It's an art. And you're right. You do have to play it well. And it can give you hope and also make you not feel alone. And that's inordinately important. I'm wondering how people can find you on TikTok or anywhere else that you'd like people to follow your videos or whatever else you're doing. Yeah, sure. Um, I I have not really become the like public persona with all the social media things so I most I pretty much just do TikTok at this point so if anyone wants to find me on TikTok my username is spooky patootie definitely made that before I knew I would be making serious content but it's stuck so we're we're sticking with it um and I, I just make I make videos about my past and I also try and insert some humor here and there that hopefully people will will relate to. It's been lovely seeing people watch and respond and and relate to me. Even the people who don't relate, that's almost better, is people who are like, what is this weird? Like, the people who are shocked, I'm just like, yes, I knew it wasn't normal. <laughs> that's so validating. Uh-huh. Okay, well, you're wonderful. And I hope that if there are other things that you want to be able to talk about and expand on, that you'll be in contact and we can talk again. And you've lived through so much and you've learned so much and now you're sharing so much and it's really your wonderful person and resource. So I appreciate you and I appreciate what you're doing. Well, I I appreciate so much you reaching out to me and asking me to be on your podcast. Um, I now very much enjoy your podcast and I'm going to be listening to it until I listen to the whole back catalog. (laughs) (laughs) That's so sweet. Okay. Well, good. All right. So wonderful to start to get to know you and hear your story. And I wish you the best. Thank you as well. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. One more thing before you go. I think it's so important when people are able to say things like Anna said. For example, I didn't know what normal was. That's a huge phrase. That's a huge admission. And I'm very glad that she can say those things because now what that does is that gives her an opportunity to try to define what normal is. But really, what is normal? And if you could see me, I'm doing air quotes whenever I say normal, because there really is no one definition of it. But when you come out into the world, you get to see who you'd like to emulate and you get to learn from popular culture and you get to see what causes you care about and how people respond to being asked certain questions and how people behave in certain environments. What is quote unquote normal when you're in a library or when you're in a classroom or when you're at a concert? And so I think it's also good to always know that you can have your own version of normal. There's much more acceptance of difference now, I think, than there's ever been before to a great degree. And that frees you up, actually, to have your own definition of normal. What I do want to be able to say, though, is that if you're not sure if you're doing things normally, find people 
who don't shame you, who don't question you, who don't say, why don't you know that? But people who will be more than happy to answer your questions, either because they have come from different situations themselves or they're just cool people who don't need to shame you for asking that question. Well, what's also true is that sometimes when people come out of very restrictive or different environments where the things that they learned were very different and they don't have necessarily a lot of life skills, they might not know how to get a job. They might not know how to get an apartment or how to handle money. They might not know how you date and even handling public transportation or being in a classroom and asking a question. If you notice that somebody is seeming a bit different, then it could be that they are wired differently or that their life has been different. But if you notice that they seem overwhelmed by something that you think they should already know by their age, or they seem confused or unsure by something you think they should already have been exposed to or, again, have mastered by that age, then if you're there noticing it and you want to be helpful, you can overcompensate by coming up to them and saying something like, going back to the school reference, let's say it's the first day of class, hey, after this, I'm going to be going to the student bookstore to get my books for class. Want to come with me? Because you have to assume if someone hasn't done this before, they don't know how to do that. They don't know where the bookstore is and they don't know how to get their books and they don't know how to find them. And they might be in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. And the older you are and the farther away you are from the age where you think you were supposed to have learned something, the less likely you are to reach out for help because the more shame you think is going to be ascribed to that moment because somehow you should know it. And there's no reason you should. So I would love for you to not feel shame about asking. But again, if you're the other in that room, in that space, go up to the person and kind of scoop them up. Offer them a chance to learn with you by going with you where you can guide them. And they didn't have to ask for help. Think of creative ways to do that. I know you can. Imagine yourself in that situation and think, how would I want to save face? What would help me hold on to my confidence here? and not feel tremendously embarrassed? How do I want to be approached if I don't know something? I don't want to be asked, how come you don't know that? Or that's so obvious. But instead, I might want to be asked, hey, um, listen, this thing that we're about to go do, yeah, it's kind of confusing. So why don't you come with me and we'll do it together? Whatever you think would calm you, typically, is something that would calm somebody else. Whatever you think would help you feel less shame is typically something that would help someone else feel less shame. So think that through when you feel like someone has had a very different life. And make sure also that you treat them in a way that they deserve, which is with a lot of credit and with a lot of respect. Because when people have had a very different life, it's easier to stay sequestered and separate from the world. So they're doing something exceedingly brave. And you want to be able to support that and notice that and treat them accordingly. And for people like Anna, when we hear from people like her, where she's able to be so open and so honest about what she knows, what she doesn't know, what she's still learning, what she needs to learn. And she's able to say that, and she's able then to get feedback from people where people say, yeah, I get it. I know. Me too. It's a wonderful feeling. And I'm glad that she's getting that support. Talk to you next week. Thank you very much for listening. Please support Indoctrination on Patreon at patreon.com slash indoctrination. 
be sure to give us a follow on our social media. Find us on Facebook and Instagram using at Indoctrination Podcast. And for Twitter, find us at at underscore Indoctrination. We love hearing from you too. So send us an email at indoctrinationshow at gmail.com. And for more updates on the show, visit our website at www.podpage.com forward slash indoctrination.